All right, welcome to our next video in the series on programming in Java. Uh, this video is all about nested for loops. So it assumes that you've had experience with regular for loops, that you understand the three components, which are the initialization, the test, and the update. What we're going to look at today is a powerful tool in programming in which you take one for loop and you put it inside another for loop. Uh, and we're going to see what kind of an output that creates. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's build a normal for loop right here. We'll say for int i equals zero, i less than two, i plus plus. That's our initialization test and update. And we're just going to go ahead and print out hello. And just looking at the components of our for loop, we see that we initialized i to zero. i is going to run up until it hits two. Once it's two, it's gone. We're going to update by ones. So that means that we should get a hello when i is zero, when i is one, and then once i becomes two and we test two, it's gonna fail. So I go and I check, and I run my program, and I see I get two hellos. Where things are gonna get interesting is what happens when I put a for loop inside of my for loop. So I'm gonna write my second for loop, and hopefully you're gonna observe a couple differences about this inner for loop. Difference number one is I had to use a different variable. Now, if you watched the previous video, we talked about a little something called scope. Scope, are, uh, scope is the place in your code in which a variable is visible. I is still in scope for the inside of my outer for loop, which means if I had tried to refer to I here, whenever I went I++, Java wouldn't know which I I was referring to. Is it the index of the inner loop? Is it the index of the outer loop? It doesn't know. So the convention is we use i as the index of our for loops. If we're nesting, then we just advance down the alphabet to the next letter. So if I have uh, one nested for loop, the inner loop is j. Um, you'll see them triple nested sometimes, in which case the innermost one is k. Uh, those are the conventions I teach in my classroom. I'm sure you might see some things different elsewhere. But that's how, that's how we're going to do it. The other thing I want you to notice is I made a different uh, test. I said J is allowed to run up until three. So we know that J is gonna happen on zero, on one, on two, but not on three. So the question we gotta ask ourselves is how many hellos do we get now? We had two before. I have an inner loop that's gonna say run three times. Do I get two hellos? Do I get uh, three hellos? Do I get five hellos? The answer is we get six hellos. And the reason for this is every time the outer loop runs, the inner loop starts fresh as if it had never run before. And the best way to track this that I know of is with a little something called a variable table. It's a lot of names for these. You'll see them called a memory table, a memory diagram, but the notion is the same for all the different ones that you do. You're gonna track all of the variables. You're gonna write down whenever their value changes. It's a process that I think probably appears pretty tedious to start, but I promise, especially students in AP Computer Science, especially uh, those of you who are considering taking the AP exam, taking the time to document the values of all of your variables is just gonna make you have a better understanding of how your code works, and it's gonna get you from question to answer a lot faster. So let me show you the documentation for what value is held by i and what value is held by j. Um, i initializes to zero first. And remember, before we ever enter the body of a for loop, we ask the question, do you pass the test? i less than two, uh, that does pass. So we're gonna say uh, zero less than two, we're good to go. So then we enter into the inner for loop, which initializes j to zero. I tend to, um, Keep when I do a variable table. This is a this is something I do that I, I'm not sure others do. Um, I will space things out so you can kind of see the timeline of when things change. So I will change. J will have a bunch of changes, and then I will change again. And you will see left to right kind of a timeline of how things change. It, it's something I think is helpful. J evaluates to zero. We say, Hey J, are you less than three? You are. So we're allowed to print out a hello. So that output is where we get our first hello. Then we're going to say, um, 
All right, J can update. J was zero, but J plus plus means it's one. And we check. Hey, J, are you still less than three? Yeah, you are. Okay, we get another hello. You know, I'm going to run out of room to write all my hellos. So I think I'm, I'm just going to discuss those instead of write those out. Uh, so we get we got a hello printed on zero. We got a hello printed on one. We go up to update. Hey, J, you become two. Two less than three still passes. We get our third hello. We update again. And this is a common misunderstanding by a lot of students. When they say J is less than three, they think that the last value that's held by J is two. But that's actually technically not true. J does become three for a moment, long enough to become tested. Once it's tested and fails, then we discard that J variable. All right, so we got a hello printed on zero, on one, on two. We failed on three. So we conclude the inside of the outer for loop and we come back up and we say it's time to update I. So now we head over here and we say I plus plus, you were zero, now you're one. We'll go ahead and test it and that test still passes. So we come back to the inside of the outer for loop, which is our inner for loop, and we treat this fresh like we had never seen it before. J doesn't remember that it was three. It was discarded as soon as the inner loop finished the first time. So J starts out fresh at zero. And we say, all right, uh, test it, passes, print a hello, update. Test it, passes, print a hello, update. Uh, tests, pass, print a hello, update again. And we update one more time to three and we fail. And then we head back to the outer loop and we go ahead and update our outer loop, which is gonna be two. And then we test that two and the two fails. And that is the conclusion of this program. So the reason you get uh, six hellos is because zero, one, and two for both times through the loop each printed out a hello. So on its surface, you can see maybe a little bit of multiplication that's happening here. Two times three is six. Six was the number that printed out. What if I wanted to uh, print out some kind of a shape? You know, we've been doing a little bit of art using ASCII table symbols. Uh, maybe I wanted to make a box of um, stars or something like that. How, how could we possibly get that done? Well, a common way to use nested for loops when printing out uh, an image is to think of that image like a grid. And something to remember is that the outer loop controls the rows. And once you're inside the outer loop, the inner loop controls the symbols in each row. Or maybe the better term would be the characters in each row. So what if instead of six hellos, I wanted to make a grid of asterisks that were uh, two by three, two rows of three asterisks each. Well, I could do this by changing uh, print line to print so that I'm gonna get three stars and I'm gonna do that twice. We're gonna compile it, we're gonna run it, we're gonna run it, and we see that all six stars set up on the same row, which isn't what we intended. So remember, in the outer loop, the, the inside of the outer loop, the top is the beginning of the, or it's the start of each row. And the bottom, the last thing that happens before it's closing curly bracket is the end of each row. So what I need to do is once I've printed my three stars, if I wanted it to be three stars and then on a new line, another three stars, I need to ask by the end of the row to go down to the next line. So we're going to do an empty print line statement, system.out.println, no arguments. It's just a way to communicate to Java, hey, when you're done printing out your stars, go down to the next row. So now when I say compile, we get uh, of the world's tiniest rectangle, two rows, three stars in each row. And so you can see in the image that we made, we can see these stopping points, right? Two rows, three stars each row. What's cool about this is this program has a lot of versatility. I can easily change the number of rows or the number of stars in each row just by changing the test in each of my loops. If I want to have something that's four rows with five stars in each row, we can compile that, run that, and kablam, we get a much bigger in, uh, image. 
So what's cool about this is, let's say I want to use one of those class constants, right? Let's say I want to make a square. So we recall that class constants get declared at the top of the class, just inside the class declaration. Maybe I want to say uh, final static int size. This is a common one you're going to use. Uh, and I don't know, I'll make it five. And what I'm going to say is, all right, I, I want a number of rows equal to the size. I want a number of stars equal to the size. And what's going to be really cool about this is because this is tied to a variable, now whenever we go to run the program, it'll give me a number of rows and a number of stars in each row equal to that size. So rather than have to change things in two places, I only have to change it in one place. If I want to make this a 10 by 10 square, I just change my class constant, recompile my code, execute my main method, and boom, we get 10 by 10. So you can see nested for loops provides an opportunity to print an image on a grid where the outer loop is, is going to control the number of rows. This said we wanted 10 rows. The inner loop is going to control the symbols on each row, right? This says give me 10 stars. And by referring to a class constant, we can change in one place uh, something that will determine the, the size or the output of our program. So that's the power of nested for loops. Uh, we used a variable table to track what the output is going to be, and we also used a class constant to change how the image that we produced scales. Okay, thanks for watching.